while you're turning there, I'm going to see if I can find another particular scripture that I wanted to make reference to. I bet I can't find it. I should have looked it up earlier, but I didn't fully think of it until now. 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 5 and verse uh, 4. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Um, many people think that this is primarily, these scriptures in front of it and behind it are primarily about wanting to get to heaven and everything. And it is talking about this tabernacle. It's talking about this body. But again, everything comes from an Old Testament fulfillment. This is an Old Testament fulfillment of that. So the tabernacle, we're now the tabernacle. We're now the temple of God. We're now the house of God. And um, so the greatest desire of Israel wasn't to go to heaven. It was to be there as God filled the tabernacle. That was what their focus was upon. And so here he's saying um, that we're groaning in this tabernacle. We're groaning. But, but listen to what it says that, and here's what we're groaning for, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. That mortality, that human frailty, mortality relates to something short-term, short-lived, something that can be killed, something that can be corrupted. And you can find that in 1 Corinthians 15, long about verse 50, 51, right in there, where it gets into all of that. Um, <clears throat> it's that which can be killed, that which can be hurt, that which can be corrupted. But he's asking that, that in him, his mortality would be swallowed up of life. And the scripture I was thinking about, and it, I know it's in Exodus, I just didn't have but a few seconds and I didn't want to wait up the, the class was the example when Moses, do you remember when Moses went before Pharaoh? And he had, you know, he had his, his uh, rod. And, you know, it's this stick, basically. And he's standing before Moses, and he's talking. And so um, he throws down his stick, and it turns into a serpent. Remember that? He throws, you know, and that represents the rod of God. That opens up the Red Sea. That... That is, uh, it's referred to as the rod. And he takes it and he throws it down and it turns into this serpent. And of course, you would think the king would go, oh, oh, oh my God, it's a miracle. This is the Lord. This is incredible. But instead, he's got his soothsayers, his, his wizards right there watching the whole thing. And he calls them over and they, there's 10 of them and they got 10 rods and they throw theirs down. And it turns, you know, they're all ten of them turn into serpents. Now, imagine if you were you were standing there in the court watching this. You'd go, at first you'd go, dude, that Moses is a real man of God. But then you would see he's outnumbered ten to one. I mean, I'm just trying to. You know, in, if in, in a real way, if you were really there and you're trying to evaluate what's God and how God is and everything, you'd go, you, you might in yourself go, you know, I mean, he's good, but our guys are better. You know, we got them beat 10 to 1. Well, the average Christian, the average Christian would look at that situation and they'd go, okay, you know, You'd throw your snake down, and then you'd see their ten, and you'd go, sick them. You know, and he'd go, he'd bite one of them, and he'd go, oh, 
oh, you know, and die. And then he'd crawl over and bite another one. He'd wrap another one up and <gasps> choke the life out of it and everything. And there'd be ten dead snakes. And then yours would stand up and go, Jesus! <laughs> Maybe not the average Irish Christian, the average American Christian. <laughs> you know, I, I, yeah, there's no snakes in Ireland. Thank God for St. Patrick. <laughs> well, we got them in Texas, girl. <laughs> we got them in Texas. <clears throat> and so, but what does happen? And, and I'm, I'm always trying to get you to think or, or to open up to the Holy Spirit. What does happen? Because what happens is important. It's not just a little event or not a little story that you go, oh, that's cool, and there's no significance. All throughout the Bible, God is trying to present himself, his way of thinking, his view of things to us, and we just read it and go, oh, that's a neat story, or that was cool. And, and, and yet maybe we continue to look for when we're outnumbered, our snake to choke the life out of the others and bite them and kill them all and, you know, and show that, you know, Jesus is way better than theirs, even though there's more with them than there are with us or whatever, you know. But there is, there is, <clears throat> there is more than a story at stake. There is the Lord and his view. There is the necessity to have our minds renewed to these things and not just, you know, think that was a neat story. Well, that was a cool way of saying that, you know, that God is better or something. So what happens? Moses is one, swallows up all the others. Swallows them up. Remember the scripture that we read right here? That mortality might be swallowed up of life swallows it all up and so um uh you know uh, the other way we would look at it is that moses's serpent raises up its head and it looks at all 10 of them and it says you need to come to jesus you must be converted accept the snake repent and come to the lord you shall you must be born again and the word of god says preach the gospel to every creature you know we're, we're going to try to convert it. We're going to try to convert the areas of our life where the devil is in it. So that it, it's just all 11 snakes are just one big happy Christian family. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Or, or, you know, it's going to, you know, our serpent will rise up and go, I rebuke you! <laughs> Get behind me, serpent! You know? And so, you know, we're going to do it like that. We're going we're gonna, to, you know, somehow either rebuke it and chase it off or change them all into Christian snakes. <laughs> You know, but but that's us, and that's I'll tell you what, and that's what we've made Christianity. We've taken Christ out of it, and it and it's become a a power struggle between God and the devil, and we're all wondering who's going to win. Like God can't defeat a created creature of His own. You know, like this really is a tough deal. Oh my God, you know. The devil's got, you know, and that's what we're always doing. The devil's got this. The devil's got that, you know. You know, I, I rem, you know, some of you remember this. Some of you are pretty new and stuff. We, we go down to Mardi Gras every year. And I mean, you talk about sin. <clears throat> I mean, you go down on Bourbon Street, and there is sin deluxe. Okay. But then you go over to... Uh, Jackson Square and you got all of the uh, uh, psychics and the you know, voodoo and the palm readers and all this stuff you know and that's where we'd minister we'd go right where the devil was you know the flesh well that's fine a lot, and a lot of the flesh people would pour out of Bourbon Street and I mean that's 
But, I mean, we'd sit down in the middle of the snakes. And Jesus would just start swallowing them up. We didn't have to rebuke them. We didn't stand there, you know, make a little circle and go, I rebuke you! You know. <laughs> what? Yeah, other, other Christians did, that's for sure, you know. And, uh, but we, you know, if they're darkness, we turned on the light, you know. And so it, there's just a mentality. And, I, you know, I remember, you know, I do remember one time walking past the, the one of the psychics was reading somebody's palm and stuff. And, and I said, I said, did, did you pay, you know, how much did you pay for that? And they said, you know, what was it, five bucks, something like that, you know, ten bucks, ten bucks, you know. Ten, you paid them, to, I said, if they knew how to read the future, they would be down in Las Vegas right now making more than ten dollars, you know. They could tell you the future, the ball's going to land on 27, you know what I mean, and, you know, I just threw away ten bucks, you know. <laughs> but there is this, this way that God is. That when he gets done, there is, no, there is no reality but God's reality, and everything else has been swallowed up of Jesus. This, remember, we're talking about leaven now. We're talking about the explanation of leaven. We're talking about whatever was there once he's been applied. You know, I, 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 remember, I remember two parties once were not getting along, and they were telling me, well, you know, and each one was trying to, say their side was right and everything. And I said, you know, Jesus doesn't take sides. Jesus takes over. And I said, until Jesus takes both of you over, <laughs> you're going to have problems, you know. Until you're swallowed up of Christ, this will always be an issue to you. It's always an issue. It's always an issue. It's always an issue, you know. And so just this whole mentality of the, this lump, this method that God wants to do. How is he going to take the world? How is he going to take me? How is he going to overcome these things? So that would mean that no improvement fulfills what God wants. For example, Moses' serpent swallows one up. Okay, Then he swallows another. And then he swallows another. And he gets to number nine and he swallows him. And number ten goes... I'll do better. No, you know what? I think I've been wrong being with those wizard guys. This, this was a bad idea. I think I'm going with the God of Moses. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try harder. You know? Would, would, would Moses' serpent gone, oh, okay, you know, as long as we're seeing some improvement, that's what's important. You know? No. No, God's not trying to improve you. He's trying to bring forth his son in you. The leaven doesn't get in there and make you sparkling wonderful. You know what? I'm free. I'm, I'm wonderful. Well, I mean, you know, that's kind of the mentality some people are shooting for, you know. Oh, now I'm just totally free. I'm just, well, you know, God wants to be totally free too, free of you. <laughs> free of your flesh that mortality who is mortal in this room well every one of us then who needs to be swallowed up of life all of you serpents <clears throat> how many how many preachers get to talk to their people the way I get to <laughs> The key, so he, picture, he pictures this thing, a little leaven put in there, and it begins to take over. The only way his will will really be done is when his kingdom comes. Thy kingdom come, my will is done. When my son reigns supreme in you, when my son has not, you have not joined sides with Jesus, but he's taken over, then, you know, it's not just, you know, the scripture doesn't just say the truth will set you free. 
you know that. But I mean, in, in uh, John chapter 8 and verse 32, we always quote it that way. But it says the truth will make you, make you, not set you free, makes you into something. What it does is that leaven, for example, a lump of, of, of dough there, and you put leaven in it for, that represents the kingdom of God. When you put leaven in it, what does it do? Does the, the, the lump of dough, is it all of a sudden go, I'm free. I'm, I feel better. No, it's completely changed. The nature of it is changed. The whole substance of it is changed. It's not the same old lump. Now, I got news for you. You're not the same old lump. Some of you, you may still be a lump. <laughs> but you're not the same old lump that you were. You're not, you are not a forgiven lump. That's not the basis of who you are. You have had the leaven of the government of Christ placed in you, and while he may not have taken over everything yet, that's his plan. To fill all things, that's his plan. The quicker we get with him on what he's working toward, the quicker it happens in us. As long as we keep working at it instead of working as long as we keep working on the lump that is not leavened trying to make it act leavened the resurrection you know that's what it causes it to do it causes the dough to rise we're trying to bring about resurrection without the leaven of Christ isn't that an interesting view as long as your focus is you then you're not working with God on what he's trying to accomplish. But as long as you realize I'm one of these other serpents and God's not trying to fix me and convert me and make me a better serpent, God is trying to swallow me up so that I'm not seen, Christ is seen. You know, that's the way it was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Right? I mean, here, here's, I mean, you got the best of the best there. You got Jesus, and then you got Moses, and then you've got Elijah, and then you've got the best of the 12, Peter, James, and John. Man, you're talking about a spiritual summit happening there. And so the disciples realizing, well, you know, I mean, we got Moses and Elijah and Jesus here, man. This is a big deal. Do you want us to make booths for you? Do you want us to, you know, set up a memorial? Do you want us to set up a, a, a you know? And as soon as they start putting the emphasis on anybody but Jesus, God sends a cloud. And we, we always think God clears away the clouds. How many songs have I ever heard about God clearing away all the clouds? God sent a cloud. And the cloud overshadowed everything but Jesus. You couldn't see, the Bible says you couldn't see anybody but Jesus only. And then a voice from heaven said, this is it. I mean, it's sad that, I mean, it's, it's. well, let me just say this. Was, was Peter still there? Yes. Was Peter seen? No, Jesus was seen. Was John still there? Yes. Was John seen? No. Was Moses still there? Yes. Was Moses seen? No. They had all been swallowed up of Christ. This is God's method. He's, that's why so many people that are converted still mess up. They're not swallowed up. They're just converted. They've changed religions or they've changed, you know what I mean, belief systems. A belief system, folks, a belief system, if it's not coming out of the core of who you are, come on, think about this. If it's not coming out of the core of who you are, you are going to break that system. Am I right or wrong? You're going to do stuff you shouldn't do. 
quo. Say, I'm not dumb. I figure that's going to happen. If it's not Christ in you, it's going to be you. And what's going to be the result of you trying to live for God? Let's see, failure, sin, mortality, right? You say, but I'm doing really good now. Well, then let's wait and listen to this sermon a couple of months from now. Because trust me, you are corruptible. You are corruptible because the basic core of your being, if it's not Christ, is corruption. So, you know, only when the king comes and starts ruling by his nature on the inside is there any hope for anybody. When his kingdom comes, all of a sudden, see, we said about to do, what, what, you know, it's like this, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We don't ask for the kingdom. We don't look for the kingdom to come. We don't look for the king to be leavened and just fill us up. We just sit there as a lump of dough and speak to the leaven on the throne, and we say, what is your will? And I'll do it. What is your will? Tell, just tell me what to do. Okay, I want you to pray without ceasing. Okay, I'm going to do that. Anybody ever committed yourself to pray without ceasing? How's that working for you? Yeah. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> so, you know, it's saying, I'm trying to, you know, God says, here's the way my, here's the way my will will be done. When the leaven has taken you over. But we don't, we, don't, we don't pray, oh God, Christ that is the leaven of this understanding, let him be on the inside of me and take over until none of me is left. We set about to do it ourselves. Because we have not by the Holy Spirit, we've seen it by being taught or whatever, but we have not by the Holy Spirit seen it enough times how God wants to change you, how he wants to change the world. We haven't seen it enough, and so we keep going back to the old covenant way of dealing, just finding out the will of God. That's what every good Jew did. Find out what God wants and set out to do it. Nothing new about that. It's old covenant. No. You, your whole point. And this is why Paul prayed. Praying for Paul was no big deal. You know, you look in all of his letters that he's writing to the churches. He says, okay, I'm going to pray for you. Okay, pray for healing. Pray for my family. Pray for my Uncle Bill. Pray for... You never see those kind of prayers in the New Testament. Not in the, the epistles. For every church, regardless of this church had one problem. Remember, the Galatians had one problem. This church had another problem. The Ephesians, another... And he would always pray something very similar in the first chapter, like in Ephesians. I pray that the, the God of glory may give unto you the spirit. This, this is church people he's praying for. Give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. He prays what, they, what we ought to be praying. Instead of, Lord, make me better, Lord, reveal the one of whom it is said there is none good but God. Bring the kingdom in me, the king as life in me, and then your will will be done. Then, you know, your will shall be done. All right, I'd, I'd referred to this earlier, but uh, look with me in Psalms chapter 17, or Psalm 17. I want you to notice verse 15. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I wake with thy likeness. I want you to notice exactly what this is saying. First of all, when he says, as for me, he's giving a contrast to certain things. 
but he's, he's also saying, I will behold thy face. Now, you know in 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says that's how the change comes. When we look into the mirror and the word of God, we behold his face, we are changed. Many people see the work of his hands. They see his hand working here. They see his hand working there. They're not looking at his face. In his face is where you find his heart. In his face is where you see what he's really like. Have you ever, no have you ever noticed like on movies and stuff, man, the, you know, the casting people know how to pick the villain because they, they're just something about the way they look, you know, and their face. And, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of movies you can tell who the villain is before anything. If you just turn the sound down, you'd go, that's the villain, that's the good guy. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of the villains are like, you know, I mean, they just reek. You know, uh, you know, you can just say, this dude's slimy. Yuck, you know. And then some guy comes in and goes, oh, you know, oh there's the leading man, you know. <laughs> and the girls go, oh, he's, he's sweet. <laughs> but, but the Lord's face, every other face is a shadow. In the Lord's face, we begin to, to not just see what he's like. The Bible says we begin to be changed. It's the only place I can find where a real change happens as a result of looking into his face, not just seeing what he can do for me. This says, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I will be satisfied when I awake, wake up, with thy likeness. <coughs> now, that scripture in itself is wonderful. But if you see the context of this, and I don't have time to go through all of it, but just the context of this psalm. For example, let's see if I can find one, because I didn't look, look at this earlier. But I know, I, you know, I didn't even look in these scriptures to see if it's here, but I know that it's got to be. Yeah, look at verse 13, which is just a few verses of, above. Arise, O Lord. Okay, arise refers to the resurrection, not deliverance. And here's proof. Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down, deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. Okay, now, notice this. He's saying, you know, deal with this person that's causing me problems, right? But here's how he says, do it. Disappoint him, cast him down, deliver my soul from the wicked he didn't say deliver me out of the out of wickedness or out of the circumstance he said my soul is freaking out the problem isn't this person the problem is my reaction can i get an amen he's saying Del my god deliver my soul because most of the time you know i mean we here's what we think deliver my soul means well i am a living soul Deliver me. No, he's saying, man, I'm freaking out. Deliver me. Arise, O Lord. I want to see you, and then I'll awake in your likeness instead of being this freaked out, you know, shivering, fumbling, scared, whatever I am. Deliver my soul from the wicked. Notice this, deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword, from men who are thy hand. See, I didn't, even look at, I didn't even look at this before. I just picked this one scripture for verse 15. But it just says it right there. He says, he's not saying, he, he calls these, the wicked, he's calling them his sword. Right? Verse 13. He's also in verse 14 calling them his hand. All right. Would it be correct for him to say, Oh, Lord, deliver me from, your, from you, the sword, from your hand. Deliver me from your hand. No. Man, you don't need deliverance from the Lord. You need deliverance from your fear because you know that that person or situation is God at work in your life. And you know the real problem you got is your soul. You're not asking for deliverance from God in your life dealing with you. You know, well, I, I take that back. Many Christians are. It's God at work. God, God has raised up somebody, and they are his sword or his hand in their life, and they don't like it, and they don't see him as that, and they pray God's hand away all the time. No, Lord. No, Lord. Please remove this, you know, 
And, we, you know, and we call it, you know, remove this wickedness. We slap the, let's see, the nail-scarred hands. You know, uh, no, take it away, Lord. Get this ugly. Oh, God, deliver me from you. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, if you, if you see what it is that you're praying, but most Christians don't. They don't even, they don't even, they've never been taught, nor do they understand what this verse says right here, that God allows these things not because he's a mean God, but because he wants us to see how our soul is the kingdom, the government of our life. Government. And we need the kingdom to come in earth as it is, as it is in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. Well, we're joined. This is the way it should be. So that's why it says, as for me, as for me, I will behold your face in righteousness, right standing. I will see myself in right standing in the right way that I'm supposed to be with you. I will be able to ex accept Shemaiah or Nebuchadnezzar or all of those that were called God's hand when they were nothing but a problem for the man of God or the people of God. The whole book of Jeremiah is Jeremiah saying, look, folks, look, people of God. This enemy is God. He's not the enemy. You're the enemy. You're an enemy to his ways. You're an enemy to the, the view that he has. You, you've come up with a different way of getting free. You want to convert everything in your life or around you so that you'll be comfortable in your flesh. He says, you're the enemy, and you'll never know that unless I send stuff into your life that exposes you. But, but if, you, if you listen to Jeremiah, he says all the time, in fact, all the prophets do this, they talk about destruction, but then they talk about restoring Israel, right? I mean, is that not a theme over and over and over in the prophets? It is. All that theme is, folks, is the cross and the resurrection. It's all it is. It is, if you're, before the cross, before you have embraced the death of I, before you've done that, you're an enemy. This enemy is slated for death. This enemy is slated for destruction. God says, whether you call it Israel, or you call it a certain man, or you call it, he says, woe unto you, woe unto you, shall, you shall be torn down and pulled down and destroyed and destruction shall come and you're going my god he's a he's mean i mean you ever read jeremiah anybody ever read jeremiah and sort of went ooh, you know like trembled in your boots a little bit you know hey i mean and you go and and you know and jeremiah if you've got to know the person by reading the book which some don't he's just the sweetest guy he just weeps over Israel all the time. He's not mean-spirited. See, because it's Christ, God doesn't choose a mean-spirited person to deliver that kind of message because they love it and it feeds their flesh. Did you hear what I said? He doesn't choose a mean-spirited person to deliver that because it's more them than the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, you stupid people. You know what I mean? You know, just, you know. No, he chooses somebody who loves them and weeps for them and cries over them. But, he ha but you know what? He's not just a mouthpiece. He's seen, he's understood the cross, and he goes, everything shall be torn down. I mean, look at, look at, uh, look at uh, John the Baptist. The crooked shall be made straight. The high shall be brought down. The low shall be, I mean, he's talking about total upheaval. Did that ever happen when Jesus came? No, not really. I mean, not if you look at it literally. I mean, it's not like Jesus came and mountains fell and, you know, roads were yanked straight. It didn't happen. Oh, it did happen. It happened right here at the cross where he said, 
And, and like I said, every prophet, that's what they're talking about. It's not an angry, vengeful God. It is God who has determined that all that is corruption and mortality must be put to death. And then he talks about a resurrection, a restoration, a bringing forth. And he says, and he begins to talk and say, you know, you know let's, let's look. And uh, I'm thinking of one in Isaiah. Look in Isaiah chapter 50, no, 51. <clears throat> so before I move on too quick, before I say this scripture and show you, he's looking at this over here and he's, he's seeing man is working on the wrong basis and he's attempting to alter conditions on a material plane when they have to be changed spiritually. They're, he's attempting to change things uh, and uh, ignoring the, the true possession of God that, touch, that takes place in resurrection where we've one body, one mind, one nature, Christ. And he begins to be in it. So... Any outward movement of God among his people, that's why he says to Israel, no, I'm going to have to tear down the temple, I'm going to have to tear this down, I'm going to have to destroy this, I'm going to have to tear it all down. Because any movement of God in the outward really doesn't do anything. Until there's a death, there can be no resurrection. Can I get an amen? There are, you don't just get raised, nobody just gets raised, only the dead get raised. Just like only the good die young, only the dead get raised, <laughs> you know. And so, um, you know, but we want God, but think about this now. We want to remain in this state, and we want God to move in our circumstances and everything while we remain unconquered. We want God to conquer our billfold, and we want God to conquer our sick body. We want God to conquer our family and our job and everything else, but we don't want to be conquered. See? So... God blesses and blesses and he does this and he does that and does that and then nothing changes and we end up more selfish than we were before. So then the prophets start speaking. Woe unto you, woe unto you. You shall, you know, and oh my God, shut up, shut up. You know, and they're going, no, no, God wants to bless. God wants to heal. God wants to, you know, and that's what basically the, pro the uh, false prophets were saying. Oh no, peace, peace. Jeremiah said they say peace, peace when there is no peace. There is no peace for this. God is not going to sidle up to Adam and put his arm around and say, I forgive you, everything's okay. It must be brought down into death. So there it is, there it is. So he does it. Then he says, "We, you know, all these promises. Well, you go, you just read it over and over, and he says, but at that day I shall come and, and uh, the, the uh, dry places will blossom and the, you know, the desert shall bloom and you know, he just goes on and on and Israel shall be a da 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 and you're just going, can't he make up his mind? I mean, my God, he's up and down. He, you know, one time he's real mad and then he just seems sweet. I don't know what to do here. He's, he's actually very stable. He is. When, it, when you're this... He's upset. When you're the old man, when you're in that which is slated for death, he ain't too happy. When you're in Christ, living by Christ, whoo! Well, let's see it. Um, Isaiah 51, verse uh, 9. Awake, awake. See, no matter how many healings you've had, no matter how many trials you've had, you have to awake in his likeness. No matter how many trials he's delivered you from, if you have not woke up, awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord, awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. So here he's talking, and, and uh, if you just, like right here in Isaiah, um, there are bunches of places where he just starts saying, awake, awake, it's just all throughout here. Uh, in fact, over in verse 17 and stuff, he's, he's saying, look, there's a work. Instead of the Lord having to come do this work, Jesus already came and did it. You're in Christ. You're crucified with Christ. The thing that's wrestling you, in you doesn't have to die. It's already dead. 
but you have to awaken to that death. But if you don't awaken to that death, then you will, you will believe this message and try to put it to death, which is like rattling the cage of a really upset gorilla. <laughs> Trying to, you know, tame something that's dead, but it's alive as long as you're not reckoning on the death with Christ. You understand what I'm saying? That you awaken to this reality... You don't bring it about. You don't kill yourself. You're dead. But you have to awaken. So he says, awake. Awake to what is. Awake to what's done. Wake up. You're asleep. You're not dead, but you're asleep. I mean, you were dead. You're crucified with Christ. But you haven't awakened to the resurrection and to your oneness with Christ and to all the resources of his life and nature that can overcome your impatience or overcome your, you know, this and that, you know. I mean, it's like, you know, we say, I'm not, I'm not impatient. I mean, people can, you know, you know, I mean, I've had people do stuff and I've just been real patient with them and everything, you know. Well, you're not impatient in that area. What about this, you know? I want to get married. I want to get married now. You know, I'm not impatient in other things, but doggone it, you know. I mean, it's just a thought, but... <laughs> You know, these, these things are part of us. It's, you know, while we might be patient with everything else, that's proof that Christ is not, we have not fully awakened to Christ that is in us. So um, look in uh, just the next chapter, verse 1. And again, all through here, you'll, the scriptures, you'll just see so many of them that start with awake, awake. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. From henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Okay. Uh, shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from thy bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Now what is this talking about? First of all, this is a prophecy from Isaiah. And he says, awake to this. There shall no more any unclean thing come into you. Zion, Jerusalem. Folks, this is Isaiah. He was way ahead of Jeremiah. He was prophesying the Assyrian captivity. Later, Jeremiah, many, many, many years later, Jeremiah starts prophesying the same stuff. So he said, awake, no more shall come any more ever again. Well, even after Jeremiah Look at all the junk that was in Israel and Jerusalem in the day Jesus came. Full of Pharisees, full of junk, right? Okay, look at Jerusalem today. Either God's a liar, because he said no more. Either God's a liar. How many of you believe God's just a liar, and that's what this is about? You know? No. What the deal is, folks, is that this is talking about us. We're Zion. We're the new Jerusalem. And if we will awaken to this reality, no more will this stuff be coming and going. Doors, gates open, walls broke down where the enemy can come running in. No, 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 not this wall. The wall is secure. We're in Christ. The devil have to, would have to go through Jesus to get to you. And he don't mess with Jesus. See? You have to awaken to this truth of first death and who it is that's put into death and then resurrection and your oneness as seen from God that is secure and does not falter or shake in his mind but you have to stay with him you have to awake you see you have to be awake you have to you know I mean it'd be like a it'd be like a husband sharing his heart with his wife you know and he's saying you know picture the camera just away you know from the bed there and it's showing him like this you know and you see her head slightly over there, and he goes, and, you know, honey, this is my view of things, and this is, you know, this is how we'll handle that, and this is everything, and then the camera draws back, and she's laying there, and she's sound asleep, and, you know, drooling, you know, you know, you know, and he just pours his heart out, tells her everything, and she sleeps through it all. Well, you know, so she wakes up, you know, and maybe he didn't notice it. She wakes up and he goes, okay, you with me? And she goes, yeah, I'm with you. 
they're, they're on two different pages. He's thinking what was in his heart, and she's thinking, yeah, whatever you want to do. She's not with his heart. She's just with doing something. Well, let's just get up and do it. What do you, what do you want to do? You know, you want to eat at Arby's? <laughs> I'm with you. He's going, eat at Arby's? I, I was talking about, do you remember me saying anything about, you know, there shall no more come in the uncircumcised? Huh? When was that? Then what land are you living in? You know, you see what I'm saying? When we, he's freed us. It's like, it's like we're in this jail cell and we're in there and we're shaking the bars down. I want out, I want out. And we lived there so long and so long and so long and so long. We've been there for such a long time. But he, Jesus comes up, opens, unlocks the gate, unlocks the door and walks on and says, come follow me. And we just sit there because we have a prison mentality and we're free, but we don't know it. You know what I'm talking about? We haven't awakened to the reality that he really did unlock the, the jailhouse door, and we can get out if we'll just follow him. Look in, uh, I think chapter 60's got some stuff on this. So yeah, verse uh, 1 and 2. <clears throat> Arise, shine, for thy light is come, not it's going to come. Isn't this interesting? Now, come on, think of this. He's, got, he's gone through this whole book from, from chapter 1 to chapter 60 to this point, and there have been rebukes galore. Amen? This is a prophet. There have been rebukes galore. But then, now think, he's spoken from, when he's speaking from over here, woe unto you, I hate you, I never want to see you again. Anybody understand? I mean, I'm just using it, but I'm trying to help you to comprehend this. Woe, standing over here and looking at Adam, Woe unto you, I hate you, and I never want to see you again. But standing over here to the same people at the same moment that he'd rebuked him, he says, Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. And you're going, Well, which is it for God's sake? Do you hate me or do you love me? Am I okay or am I messed up? This is confusing, Jesus. You're confusing. Maybe, maybe he's not confused at all. Maybe we are. Maybe we're just standing in Adam. We're just this lump that hadn't got any leaven in us. We're just sitting there as a lump. And what? no matter what he says, nothing clicks in. Except, I don't think he really, really likes me. If he did, why does he go back and forth? Sometimes he loves me, sometimes he hates me. Is this a love-hate relationship? No, he doesn't love-hate Adam. It's very clear. He hates Adam. <laughs> he loves Jesus. Are you in Adam? Are you in Christ? If you're in Adam, you are seen as one with the fallen race. If you're in Christ, you're not seen at all. Christ is seen. And you're seen as one with him. And that's his heart. And it's settled. He, that's why he doesn't say, Arise, shine, for if you'll awake, the glory of the Lord will be risen upon you. No, no, no. He's saying, Awake. You are there. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. It's done. It's settled. Wake up to it. He's not trying to get them to bring it about. <clears throat> but they have to know who they are to his heart and how they are that. Because if you don't know how, if you don't know how, if you just say, okay, I'm going to just say it like this. If somebody feeds you that you're the bride of Christ and you're just lovely to him and everything and you don't know anything about the death and resurrection, folks, that's going to end up messing you up. Because you'll apply that to what's fallen. You will, and you'll go, I'm lovely, you know. And, you know, and you, you know, you'll get in a situation and you'll get mad at somebody and you go, you stupid idiot, you don't stop it. And you go, but I'm his bride, so I'm lovely to him no matter what. Do you see what I'm saying? And he'll go, well, that's not really Jesus, was it? You go, no, but at least I'm lovely because I'm your bride. He goes, you're the bride of Frankenstein, you know. <laughs> 
Are you getting my point? There has to be this death and resurrection comprehension. Or you'll read, you'll read any of the, the prophets and, and you'll just go, well, which is it? You will not know. And therefore, that's why some people, I mean, they have these, they, they say, well, you know, you don't need the Bible anymore. Just read this precious promise book. And they cut out all the scriptures that would deal with you as in Adam. And it only talks to you like Adam is sweet and accepted and loved and has got all the promises. I'm sorry, Adam is rejected and crucified with Christ. God's only promise for Adam is, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> sorry, that's a little old brother, where art thou? <laughs> You know, his only promise is, you know, woe unto you. I'm going to bring you down. I'm going to, I am going to, you know, the crooked shall be me. I'm going to tear it up. I mean, before I get through with it, it's going to be destroyed and then burned. And then the ashes are going to be plowed under. That's what he said of Jerusalem that now is. He didn't, just, you know, he said in the rocks, the stones that are burned with fire, I'm going to take them and plow the ground and plow them under. And I'll grind you to powder. That's. You know, quit trying to get God to bless what he's rejected. For, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Folks, that is nothing more than a spiritual interpretation of creation. Instead of the, the uh, creation account supposed to be a, a historical and I believe that there is, there's historicalness to it. But a historical account of the creation doesn't change you. If it's going to have any effect, it has to become real by life. And he's giving the description of it right now. He says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the peoples. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen. And there are other scriptures. Jeremiah has a great one on this same thing that literally quotes Gen the Genesis account where he says, God said, you know, the, and behold, the earth was without form and void. That means empty. Okay, well, what have we been talking about? Leaven filling up all things. He must increase and you must decrease. God's method. So he's not, you know, what happens to darkness? Is darkness converted? Is darkness convinced? No, it disappears. It's swallowed up by light. You know, you've heard me use the example. You, you know, you're fighting the darkness of your life. You know, I rebuke you. And I just like the, the snake thing. You know, I rebuke you. Get out of here and everything. Just turn on the light. Just bring forth Christ. Just, just arise to the dawning of the, what, what, the, what Peter called him, the day dawn. The day dawn. Woo! I was in darkness, but whoa, that's a beautiful. Anybody ever seen a beautiful sunrise out there in uh, Arizona? I bet there's some glorious ones. I was stationed in El Paso, which is very similar to where they were in Arizona. Incredible. I mean, you know, we would bivouac out on the desert. I was in the Army, and we'd just be sleeping in these pup tents and everything, and there's sand blowing, and it's cold and everything else and we're out there in the desert in the middle of the night and everything and I remember you know getting up in the you know 4 30 in the morning to get up and then you're going to put on full pack gear and run for an hour that's how before breakfast you know and so you know I remember getting crawling out of that pup tent and pulling my backpack on and looking at the sunrise and going oh my god that's gorgeous like when I was laying there at night I was thinking I'm in hell <laughs> it's cold the sand is blowing this is you know. but when the day dawns you're just going man that's just gorgeous it just changed everything where's the darkness where's the cold because when the sun starts shining you start warming up when the sun shines, then all then you can see, you know. You can see if there's a snake in your tent. You know? You can move. You can adjust. Light has come. 
Well, that's what the scriptures are talking about. Um, I guess one more scripture and we'll close. How much time we got left? Six minutes. Uh, I, still in Isaiah, I guess. We'll do Isaiah 9, and then I'll close with this. Isaiah 9 and verse uh, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. All right, we know this is speaking of Christ, right? Does not leaven speak of an increase of his government? Does not thy kingdom come, thy will be done, speak of an increase of his government? Isn't that exactly what it's talking about? But folks, he's naming off stuff here that's, that's about Jesus that's supposed to be an increase. For, for example, if I just took one of Prince of Peace, that's supposed to be an increase of his government. I mean, you know, why should our comprehension of Jesus as Prince of Pre Peace, first of all, just be an outward thing that's going to happen one day? This is talking about an increase of his government. This is talking about, you know, him first controlling us and having control in our lives and over the souls of men, our soul life. But when we read scriptures, much of it has no impact on our life because we keep putting stuff off. Well, let's just keep putting it off and then I'll never have to face these things. But it's when you face them in the resurrection, they're not hurtful. I mean, we hear about dying with Christ and all that, and all we can think about, uh, imagine, imagine Adam over here. Now, picture Adam over here on this side of the cross who knows nothing of the glory of oneness with Christ and of the resources of his life, and him, somebody saying, now, all you got to do is die. Everything within Adam says, I don't want to die. I don't want to give up. I don't want to lose. Can I get an amen from any Adam in the place? Oh, thank you. <coughs> but, I mean, it's, it's true. I mean, all of us. This is true of me. This is true of you. Over here, it's, it can be a fearful thing. My God, what am I going to have to lose? What is this going to cost me? Anybody ever, you know, ask that? I remember one of my Mardi Gras tracks on the front of it. It says, what do I have to give up to follow Jesus? And you open it up and it says, hell. But I mean, the, you know, I mean, it just sort of reduces it down to, well, I guess this ain't as bad as I thought it was, but, you know, it makes it real simple. But there, there's just this fear in Adam. But I tell you what, and we'll get into this eventually. We'll, we'll probably get into this the next couple of classes, Lord willing, about the meaning of hyssop in relationship to Passover. And that's how we got into this whole leaven thing anyway. Remember, this is all relating to the Passover and getting rid of the leaven. I just wanted you to have a balanced approach because, frankly, any time leaven was ever mentioned to most of you, would you not admit you automatically thought of sin? I mean, that's just... Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. So I just want you to have a balanced approach and realize that there's there are much more to this stuff than, you know... So I'm... So anyway, so I'm... You know, it's saying... You know, the government shall be upon his shoulders. Um, he's the one that's wonderful, counselor, mighty God. He's the prince of peace. Of his, the increase of this government, he's going to, like, like leaven, he's going to just keep increasing and increasing and increasing, uh, so much so that then all of a sudden, here he is in the very end. He's sitting on a throne, and he's sitting within the walls of New Jerusalem, which was described as the Bride of Christ. So it's not a building. It's not a city. It is the Bride of Christ, which is us. We are his city, his habitation, his place that he lives. But there's something else happening. Flowing out from the Lamb, flowing out from the throne, is a river. And it's bringing healing. But it not just comes out from the lamb and the throne. It's coming out of her too because he's sitting on the inside of the, the bride of Christ. The new Jerusalem. And these healing waters are flowing out of her. And it's bringing peace 
and healing everywhere it goes. How is that? Because for her, the Prince of Peace is now. The Prince of Peace is not something that's going to happen. He's not one day going to be wonderful, counselor. All, he, all this wonder of Jesus will come out of her. All of this counseling will come out of her. All of these things that, that it describes, that this might, the time where you need might, or you, the everlastingness of his endless life, or Prince of Peace. There is an increase of Christ to such a degree that it is no longer I. And, and you get to the place, because of the cross and the resurrection, that you rejoice over the thought that just the thought of it starts happening. Oh, that it could actually no longer be me, but Christ. What a blessing that would be. That actually sounds like the most glorious message you've ever heard. More of Jesus, less of me. I mean, you go to any church, any church, and you stand up in front of that congregation, and if you said, more of Jesus, less of me. I think most of the people go, yeah. But then if you walk over to the chalkboard and say, okay, well, here's how that's going to take place. You're going to have to be dead. You're going to have to understand that you're crucified. And they go, I'm leaving this church. Am I right or wrong? I mean, it's like uh, the concept I want, but the reality, do not ask that to be in my life. I don't want to, you know, uh, I'm, more of me, you know? And that's really where we get upset and have problems with people. No, no, not you. Not you having that, not you doing that. More of me. <laughs> you know? I don't, I don't like it that you got that honor. More of me. I want that. You don't need it. You got a lot. I need it. No, no. What's so needy in there? You know, you, you know that. <laughs> I need that. I need it. Give, give me. You know, that's nothing more than what died on the cross. Quit feeding it, because all it's going to do is want more. You say, if I could only have that. Oh, please. If I could only have a husband, if I could only have this, if I could only have a car, if I could only have a good stereo, if I could only have an iPod. Well, something new will come out and you, you'll you be upset that you got an iPod when this new thing has come out. Now, now I want an iPhone, you know. I mean, it's, it, it's endless. The flesh profiteth nothing. And that's, I'll try to close with this. Jesus said, the flesh profiteth nothing. It is the spirit that gives life. All right. Let's stand up and we'll just pray and leave this here place. I already chased off the missionaries. Glory to God, huh? Anybody glad to be in a place where you can get fed the truth that is as it is in Jesus? Father, we just long for you. We just desire, Father, we just desire your son to be able to live in his body, to be able to, really have a habitation in the temple, which is us. Father, keep, our, keep the fires of desire in our heart burning for you, burning for your Son. Holy Spirit, teach us, not just that we sit in a class here and think we're learning it because we don't learn this in a class. Holy Spirit, come and teach your people. Impart life. Yes, bring to remembrance things that have been said. Yes, quicken things, but it is not what I've said that will make the difference. Holy Spirit, 
we honor you and we know that we just we we will think we know it when we don't unless you get in and really form it up.